of three bad brothers that you know so well. It started way back in history with that rock. MCA. And me. Mike D. D. thought back in 1986 when three white rappers from New York calling themselves the Beastie Boys exploded into our world that they would eventually become the respected musicians that they are today. The then cartoonish trio consisting of King Ad Rock, Adam Horowitz, MCA, Adam Yauch, and Mike D, Michael Diamond, have proved everybody's initial impression wrong by metamorphosizing into the groundbreaking musical pioneers they are now. I think it was an exciting time in New York when the Beasties were first teenagers coming together. Uh, and there was this sort of growing New York punk rock scene. Everybody was really obsessed with music. I mean, it was pre-MTV, so you really had to like go out there and look for it. I feel lucky to, to have grown up a certain time in New York City in the early 80s. I got exposed to a lot of things. And there were so much different styles of music going on at that time that we were all really curious. So we are all like obsessed with me. I think we were all very similar in high school. I think we all sort of... Uh, I think we all like, never got along with high school. We used to go to nightclubs all the time, so we didn't used to make it to high school. There wasn't really a lot of native New York hardcore punk rock at that time. Right, 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 now! I think the Beasties were part of a movement that said we should make some of this that's ours. They all say that uh, they remember uh, this Black Flag show. First, I think the first time Black Flag played in New York. And afterwards, uh, Yauk said to his friend John Barry, man, there's no hardcore bands like that in New York. Let's start one. And so they did. Originally, the lineup was Yauk on bass, Kate Schellenbach, now of Luscious Jackson on drums, Mike D is the front man, and John Barry on guitar. When we first started the Beastie Boys, it was kind of like a joke. And we were making, kind of making fun of hardcore music and how easy it was to write a song and just come up with three chords and sing about, you know, look out the window and be like, the bodega about across the street. And, uh, and the next thing we knew, we were like playing for people and people were really into it. The first time we ever played in front of people was at a, a house party at John Barry's house. So I was like, a, my birthday party. And like right after that, Dave Parsons came up and said, hey, you guys want to make a record? In 1982, the band released the Pollywog Stew EP on Rat Cage Records and started playing shows in the local New York clubs. If it had all ended after that, it would have been mission complete as far as we were concerned in terms of how long we envisioned it going. So, hey, everything beyond that was gravy. Boys used to be a hardcore band. We were all, what, like 13, 14 years old. And uh, a couple years later, our guitarist left. Adam joined the group. I had my own group at the time. He had another group called The Young and the Useless, also a hardcore band. Notice Dave Skilkin. kind of like the uniting of the hardcore dudes. And then uh, I was the b-boy element of the hardcore element. You he, know? Was, he was the b-boy element of the hardcore element. And we moved into the rap thing. In the early 80s, clubs would let kids in for some reason, so we would go see all these different bands. At those clubs downtown where you'd hear, like, new wave-type dance records were the first places, like, in, in clubs that we'd go to where all of a sudden you'd hear the transition of hip-hop. You know, so it was like this complete cross-section. It was really, really wide open, and everybody was just kind of checking out what everybody else was doing. There wasn't really anything. There wasn't really a lot that had much to do with blending sounds the way that the Beasties were doing very early on. I guess as we continued as a band, as a hardcore band, but also we started getting into hip-hop and we recorded a song called Cookie Puss, which is 
just barely makes it into the hip hop genre. Yo, I said I'm calling you, mate. In college, I was a college radio program director, and there was this one record that I had gotten in uh, called Cookie Puss. Hello? Hello, man, you got Cookie Puss's number? Here's my supervisor, he'll help you. And it's just really strange and had like scratching on it and tapes going forward and backwards. And you know, it was talking about this, this Carvel ice cream cake. It was just really bugged and it, it was, you know, hip hop the way it ought to be, basically. The inspiration behind the song is we really like ice cream and Carvel cookie post cake is vanilla with little chocolate bits and then chocolate. And then it's actually Tom Carvel's nephew that bailed us out of like, you know, oh, yeah. a little bit of controversy over like us calling, you know, the Tom Carvel place. about suing us, but uh, our guy Kevin told him to chill out. Cookie Puss, I want to speak to Cookie Puss, man. I remember I was in San Francisco and I heard the Beastie Boys on the punk rock radio station there and just thought, this is the greatest thing I've ever heard. It's fantastic. When I came back to New York, we hooked up after that. Enter Rick Rubin, known in those days as DJ Double R. Rubin was a New York University student by day. He was also in the process of starting up Def Jam Records with Russell Simmons, Run DMC's manager, out of his dorm room. In 1984, the Beastie Boys, minus Kate, were signed to Def Jam Records as one of their first artists. I'm not sure exactly how it came to the point of Kate not being in the group anymore, if it was like Rick's suggestion or it was just like we were headed that way or whatever, but it definitely, as we became more focused on hip hop, Kate became less and less involved. You know, eventually they went off with Rick and uh, things started. Years old, traded their instruments for turntables and mics and set off to introduce themselves to the nation by hooking up with one of the world's biggest stars. It was a train wreck waiting to happen. 